We're in Mark, Mark 10, uh, 23 through 31. Uh, we'll finish this today, and um, Lord willing, uh, well, we will. We'll see how much we get into it. Uh, let me start by reading it and then opening in prayer. As Jesus looked around, he said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished. And they said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Heavenly Father, as we look at these words that um, the Holy Spirit led for Mark to record and uh, that are really words from your son, we pray that we would um, let these words sink into our hearts, that you would open the eyes of our hearts to understand these truths, that you would incline our hearts to these truths, and that they would be become very real to us. We would understand how important this is of what Jesus is speaking and why the disciples were amazed and the reward that are, that is there for those who... Uh, do abandon all and follow you. Um, we pray this in your son's name. Amen. So uh, last week we looked at the encounter with a rich young ruler. Um, the young man was successful in wealth and very successful in religion. So we, we looked at he was not just a wealthy man, but he also was a very religious man because he was a lay leader in a synagogue, likely. That's what the ruler means. Uh, we know he was young. Um, and we know he was a ruler based on uh, the different passages I listed them up here. Um, there, Mark, Matthew, and Luke all record this. And not every instance in Jesus' life do all three of this, what's called the synoptic gospels, record. And when they show up in all three, um, usually you can get the, the message that maybe this is important. Maybe the Holy Spirit or maybe the disciples said, this is a really important thing, let's capture it. So, and the more I have studied this, the more I've realized that this is a really important um, passage to understand salvation. Not just salvation, but the deception of people when they look at salvation. And last week we looked at uh, this young man had three different deceptions that he was uh, deceived about. First of all, he was deceived about what good is. Um, he was calling Jesus a good teacher, and Jesus, um, probably seeing more than what he said, um, said, listen, only God is good. And uh, the man, of course, didn't approach Jesus as if he was God, which he was. Um, he just mentioned, well, only God is good. Why do you call me a good teacher? In essence, is what he was saying. And that, that confronts uh, one of the big deceptions that the world has. Um, and I hear this all the time, that oh, I'm basically good. I'm basically good. And they, they measure goodness on a scale of evil to perfectly good. And they're somewhere over here. And, and this person is over here. And this person is over here. And Jesus kind of blew that out of the water. And it's a very radical statement when you think about it, that only God is good. Now, if you follow that to the letter, um, to say that person is good, it's a good person, that's a good person. Well, that's not a biblical statement from God's perspective. Now, I know what we're saying. I'm not saying you're around calling everybody evil. But from God's perspective, only he is good. So if you're using the term um, as Jesus uses it, um, as Jesus defines it here, that only God is good, that's quite a change from the way we think. Even us in this room, let alone what the world thinks, that they're basically good. So that was a pretty radical statement. The second deception he had, um, uh, well, first on the goodness, it's, it's an absolute measurement. It's not a relative measurement. So it's not a comparing measurement of goodness. God is good. And so you measure yourself against the perfect um, uh, the perfect standard of goodness, which is God. And every man, if he measures himself against that standard, is going to fall short. And, you, and that's the point, right? So if you hold forth that truth, only God is good, now measure yourself against him, um, you know, we're going to fail. And, and I think that's the point. And you're going to see that in the second deception, which is around the law, the nature of the law. From the young man's perspective, he had kept all the law from his youth. In fact, he said that um, in verse uh, 20, when Jesus gave him a list of these um, 
I call them external commandments, one that you can judge. I, I know there's an internal aspect to it, but he's just speaking to this man. Other people are listening. And he said, don't murder, um, you know, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't defraud, honor your father and mother. And uh, that's something anybody standing around him has said, well, no, you don't. You don't do those things. And the man says, I've, I've observed those from my youth. And nobody stood up and said, well, no, you haven't. <laughs> You, stole, you, you said you were going to pay me money and you never paid me money or you lied to me or I know you slept with this other woman or whatever. There's an external measurement that he had there. And he says, no, I've kept these all from my youth. And um, we know from the teaching of the time um, that, that uh, this was one of the paths towards eternal life. Um, but as Gene mentioned last week, um, this man probably saw that there was something missing. So he had all the religious teaching and followed, but there's something missing. And that's the reason why he ran to Jesus. He fell down on his knees and he, and he said, good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? There's something missing. For him to do that to Jesus near the end of Jesus' ministry, I mean, Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem, which is, you know, um, before going to the cross. And um, the Pharisees hated him. The leaders hated him. And for this man to do this publicly, there had to be something in his heart where he was He's saying, I'm missing something, right? Um, but he's saying, I've kept these, this law from my youth. And their teaching said that uh, if you keep the law, then God is happy with you. And that's one of the, one of the reasons why he might let you into heaven, uh, was the teaching the rabbis had. Now, Jesus didn't challenge his statement. He gave him another test. Um, I don't know if you missed this, and I may not have uh, spelled this out really well last week, but he gave another test. Okay, um, you notice he said, I loved him. Or he said, Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And said to him, and uh, as I thought about this, even after last week, I think what he's doing is just, he said, I, I love this man, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to reflect his heart right back to him, right? Which, if you love somebody, that's one of the best things you can do. Because unless somebody wants to change, I mean, you've probably met people that don't really want to change, and you can't help them. Until they want to change or they see a problem, they don't, want to be, uh, they don't want to be helped. And I think that's what Jesus is doing. He loves them and he reflects his heart right back to him. He goes right after the biggest and the greatest commandment um, is found, really the first commandment is to have no other gods before me, right? Depending on how you measure the commandments. I recently learned that there's four or five different ways of measuring and counting the commandments. But generally the first commandment is you should have no other gods before me, make no graven image. Some people combine those, some people count them as the first and the second. Um, but that's the first commandment. Um, that's something the Jews prided themselves in. We have no other gods before us. There's no graven images, right? There's no idols. There's no images. And they really would, even in Jesus' day, that was one thing that had been completely worked out of their system is no more idols. Um, but that was an external thing, not an internal thing. And Jesus is reflecting his heart. And he says, so sell all you have, give it to the poor and come follow me. The invitation is come follow me. But he's showing that the obstacle to come follow me is sell, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. Um, many other people, he just said, follow me. But to this man, he's showing his condition by saying, do these things and then come follow me. And he showed to this young man that he had broken really the first commandment and he had broken um, what they call the Shema. So you know that there's this, uh, if you see an Orthodox Jew to these, this day, um, what are the things that stand out about a Jewish person that's very orthodox? What do you see right away that identifies them as a, yeah, something on the head, but something that they, the phylacteries, can you describe what that is? Like a box strapped to their forehead that has the uh, Shema inside. Yeah, that has the Shema in it. Yeah, and they take the Shema literally, and that's found in uh, Deuteronomy 6.5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And he goes on to say, you should bind these upon your forearms and your head and things like that. And they take it literally. So they have an actual box um, and they put that this verse and they write the verse themselves and put that in the box and they wrap it around their head. And the more religious people have bigger ones <laughs> um, because they're more holy, right? And um, Jesus even called this out. Uh, but um, he says, you make your phylacteries wide and big so everybody can see how spiritual you are. And if you go into any Orthodox Jewish house, right to the left, when you walk in, there is uh, this verse. There's always in this verse. And in any, any, I believe any door you come in to the left, there's supposed to be this verse. Um, so anyway... It might be the right. I can't remember what it is, but it's supposed to be, there's a very specific spot. But he broke this. There was something that he loved more than God, right? That was his wealth. 
And it, it's, it t tells you that in verse uh, 20, what is it, verse um, 22. Disheartened by the saying, Luke says he was very, very sad. He walked away because he had great possessions or great wealth. And uh, so Jesus held a mirror up to him and he walked away and says, that's, that's something I can't do. And he demonstrated that there was something greater in his, in his, um, in his life. Um, so he was deceived about the purpose of the law. He believed there was life in following the law, but this is not the case. Um, and I suspect he knew it in his heart that there was not life in the law. Paul teaches us in Galatians and Romans that the law was given to increase trespasses, um, to increase sin. That's in Romans 5.20. And the law was meant to be our guardian, or, or you might say chaperone. It's a very unique Greek word. And it's somebody who would, um, you would hire to follow your child around until they got to a certain age. And the whole point was not that they controlled everything that they did. They just made sure they didn't get any moral issues that would disqualify them from being an heir you know, to the uh, estate or, or to bring shame on the father's name. And so you would hire this person. This was this Greek word. Uh, best translation would be guardian. Um, we might, the uh, closest, I think, in our uh, vernacular might be chaperone. Um, like when high school goes off on overnight trips, you always have so many chaperones. And there's, I mean, you, we all know why. And, and that's kind of the idea of what the guardians, but that's the point of what the law did is they guarded you. And in, um, in Galatians 3.24, it says, so that, so the law guards us so that we may be justified by faith. So it, it reflects back to us and guards us and brings us to the point where we realize we need a savior so we can be justified by faith. So those are the first two deceptions. The third deception rolls right into what we're gonna talk about today and the amazingness, uh, the, the, uh, the astoundedness, the exceedingly astoundingness. And I know that's not a word. Uh, they were exceedingly astounded, and we'll say that. The disciples, the disciples were. It's a really descriptive word. Um, and uh, so looking at this one about wealth, Jesus tells him to sell all he owns, give it to the poor, and follow him. The give to the poor is a challenge to release his ownership of his wealth. And this is not a call to salvation through poverty. Like some people have interpreted this literally and say, oh, so that's how you become a Christian or become saved is you just relinquish everything, give up everything and follow Christ. Um, and when you take the whole counsel of God, that's not what he's saying. I think what he's saying is like the parables of the pearl of great price. To get the pearl of great price, what did the man do? Sold everything to buy the pearl of great price. What about the treasure in the field? He sold all that he had, bought the field, so he had the treasure. I think it's a willingness that something is more important. I'm willing to give this up because this is more important. Mm -hmm. I was going to say at the shop I work at, there's a house that's uh, had a renter before. And I remember him being pretty extremist, but I remember him shaming me because I had a car payment. <laughs> yes. But, yeah, he, he shamed me. It's like, you're not supposed to have any debt because he was richer than that. Anyways, yeah, he was very, what, what you just said. Yes. Yeah, and um, just because... Um, a way to say this is there, there are people who don't have wealth, that wealth has a greater um, uh, place on the throne of their heart than somebody who is wealthy. I've met people who are wealthy that it's just money. If God wants to take it, that's fine. He's given it to me. I'm going to use it wisely. But if he takes it, it's okay. It's not, it's not a problem. But then I've met people who don't have anything that it's all they talk about is I need to modify my life so I can get money and I'm everything I'm doing is so I can get money. I, I'm hustling, I've got a side gigs, I've got all these other things because I want money. They really serve money and money is really sits on that throne of their heart. So it doesn't mean that you have to have wealth to be falling into this trap and it could be something besides wealth. Um, remember that uh, there, were, there was a series, and I can't remember where it was, but there were three different people that came to Jesus and says, I wanna follow you and he says, but first let me go bury my father. And then, and then the person says, well, first let me, go, let me go sell the ox, or first let me go check this out, or first let me go do this. And Jesus would say things like, you know, no, you follow me first. And um, then you may have those things, but you follow me first. That's, that's the most important thing. And I think that's, that's the point of what he's saying here. And he's just speaking to this uh, wealthy, rich young man individually. So, so looking at this, the challenge, um, he, he challenged him in commandments. He failed at that. He challenged the second challenge was also in the commandments. He failed at that. Um, and now he's going to talk about the wealth. Now, um, you notice the response of the disciples in the passage we're going to look at today. Uh, they were astounded or amazed. And um, I think to understand that, you have to understand a little bit about the Jewish understanding of wealth. Um, it was different than ours in our culture. 
um, their understanding of wealth um, is really found in Scripture. Um, I think it's a misinterpretation of Scripture, or it's a it's putting something there that isn't there. Um, but if you look at, uh, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it to you, but in Deuteronomy 8.18, uh, well, before I read these, they interpreted these passages saying that wealth was a symbol of God's blessing. So think of the opposite. How many times, I remember that the one person who was, um, I think he was lame, either lame or blind. I, I think he was lame. Um, and he was lame from, or blind. No, he was blind from birth. And he was sitting outside the temple and the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned? <laughs> Their assumption is, well, he's being punished by God for a sin. It was his mother's and father's sin or was it his sin? Now, this person has been from birth and Jesus corrected him and said, no, no, that's not, that's not the point. Um, so that's the opposite side of what I'm going to say, which is, the, they, so the opposite side was, well, if you're blessed by God, you're going to have great wealth. And more than that, a wealthy person was closer to God and from their teaching than somebody who was poor. Because not only are they blessed, but they also can do things that God asks you to do, um, that they have the wherewithal to do it. So in essence, you're purchasing your salvation. Now, let me read a couple of these verses that, um, and I got this just went online and searched through some Jewish teaching, and it's modern teaching as well. But um, Deuteronomy 8.18, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. So they take the, well, God has the power to give wealth, and he does this to confirm the covenant. In other words, they, they read into that. So therefore, somebody who has wealth is blessed by God. God's happy with them. They're doing the right thing. Therefore, they're blessed by God. Um, 1 Samuel 2, 7, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. So again, they see that God is the one who's in control of who is poor and who is rich, um, who is, um, uh, what was the, the second thing? Um, he brings low and he exalts. So not only is this rich young ruler been exalted, blessed by God into that position, he's also been blessed by God with wealth. So from the disciples' understanding from that cultural teaching, this person is blessed, this rich young ruler is blessed by God. And so certainly someone who's blessed by God is closer to eternal life than somebody who is not. Do you see the logic here? Um, then Ecclesiastes 5.19 says, God gives riches and wealth. It says the same thing in Ecclesiastes 6.2. Um, and this very interesting one in Proverbs 38 through 9 um, remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty or riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full, so lest I be rich, and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Um, or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of God. Now, what's interesting about that is you see a result of somebody who is rich. He's, he's praying to God, Don't give me too much and don't give me too little. Because if I have too much, I might say, Well, who is God? I don't need you. Right? We, we understand that. And I might be poor and I might steal and I might profane your name. And in some versions, it actually interprets that as take God's name in vain. We a lot of times think of take God's name in vain as swearing. But um, uh, I think you can make the case throughout Scripture that taking God's name as vain is claiming to be something you're not. Claiming to be his child and not living like it. right? Which adds a whole different aspect to that phrase, take God's name in vain. But you see here, the prayer is to God who gives wealth and who takes away wealth, and he's saying, just give me the right amount. Not too much, not too little. Um, so then I found some quotes. So that's in Scripture, but here's some interesting quotes, and you think that was uh, impactful. Listen to this. So they took those verses, and this is what they taught. So from the book of Tobit, um, it says, Alms deliver from death, and this will purge away every sin. So somebody who's wealthy can give alms, and almsgiving, um, uh, we'll talk about it here in a second, but almsgiving and righteousness actually were two interchangeable words. They would use righteousness and giving money as the same thing. They, they use them as the same words like synonyms, which are not, they're not, but that's, that's how they used it. Um, the book of Sirach chapter 3 says this, alms will atone for sin. That's pretty, pretty drastic. From the Talmud, now the Tobit and Sirach, are those are, Sirach is a... Um, is what you've ever heard of the Apocrypha. Those are books in the intertestamental between Malachi and Matthew. And uh, I believe uh, Catholics use that in there. If you get the Catholic Bible, they'll have, is it five or six or seven extra books that are in there? I don't remember how many. I've never read them, but that's where this is. You say, well, okay, that was Apocrypha. Um, well, here's the Talmud. The Talmud was the central text for mainstream Judaism. So this is where you would say, how do I become a good Jew? How do I live righteously? This is what it said. 
Almsgiving is more excellent than all offerings and is equal to the whole law. It will deliver from the condemnation of hell and make one perfectly righteous. Mm. Almsgiving, giving money. Um, and uh, so you can see why uh, the disciples might think that somebody who is rich, they have the ability to give more than somebody who is poor. So if almsgiving is righteousness, and it's greater than all the offerings and sacrifices, not only can they afford offerings and sacrifices, they can give more alms, right? Um, and the word righteousness uh, for later Jews literally mean to come, mean, uh, came to mean alms. We do something similar. We say we give, we also say we give charity. Charity is actually love. It's not giving. I demonstrate my love by giving, but we use charity and giving as interchangeable words, right? We say that person gave a lot of charity. Well, what you meant is they gave a lot of money. Well, this is what they would do is you, that person has a lot of righteousness because they would see the person giving a lot of alms and they would use them interchangeably. In fact, it shows up even in our Bibles. If you have a KJV, in Matthew 6, 1, the word um, in, in Greek, remember it says, don't do your righteousness before men, right? Um, when the KJV interpreted that, they actually put um, righteousness there um, I'm sorry, they put alms there. They didn't put righteousness. Don't give your alms before men. But the Greek word is righteousness. It's um, diakosun in the Greek. The translators use alms in its place. So they kind of pulled in this, this Jewish idea that alms and righteousness are the same thing. But in the Greek, what Jesus said is don't do your righteousness before men, but they put alms before men. Don't give before men. And it's a really interesting thing that showed up even in our Christian Bible. Um, so why so much, spend so much time on this? I think it helps this passage. I'm spending a lot of time here because the passage falls in a place when you understand where the disciples were coming from. And so you take all this teaching, what scripture says, and they wrongly interpret it, but what it said, what their leaders said, and then you get an understanding of what the culture saw when they saw a rich person, especially a rich and religious person, both of those together, they would be seen as somebody that's closer to God. The world sees this too. They look at somebody doing what the world interprets as holy, and they say, well, that person's really close to God. Or I can show that person a lot more respect. Even though they may not have any respect for religion or whatever, they can look at somebody and say, that person's holy when you show a little respect there, right? Um, this to the disciples. I believe the disciples were believers at this point. That the great confession of Peter is behind them. Um, and I think he spoke for the disciples. I think they believed that Jesus Christ was the son of the living God, that he was the Messiah. But they carried a lot of this cultural baggage and here they are, and Jesus is taking the time to correct them. Um, that's why I think he repeats this three different times. Um, so I think it helps us understand what he's saying. And uh, so Jesus is, as always, masterfully showing that man not only breaks all the laws of God, he's saying it is not possible to save himself and as a condition of total helplessness to get eternal life. All of this with that one question. Um, and unless you see this cultural background, though, it's easy to miss the weight of this conversation, the impact that it had on the disciples. And so this issue is why it shows up in three different synoptic gospels. It's, it's a really important issue. And when did last, um, well, remember I said that Jesus loved him and held up the mirror. Um, I don't have time to go into this, but if you want to jot down James 1, 23 through 25, um, I think it's, a, it's an explanation of what Jesus was doing to this man. It says he loved him and he shared with him. And in James, he says that the law is like a mirror. It reflects my heart back to me. And a wise person uh, will, will actually take that to heart literally and walk away and remember what I learned. And an un a fool walks away and forgets what he looks like, right? And I think it's talking a spiritual, a spiritual um, condition here. So we ended last week by looking at an earlier passage in Mark 4 in the parables of the soils, that this, this rich young man was one of the soils. It was a thorny soil. Um, and it says, the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. And I think that's an illustration of what happens. So, um, so now the disciples' lesson. All that introduction, but uh, like I said, I think this will flow really quickly once you, once you have that background. Um, and this lesson that Jesus gives to the disciples, you, sometimes you can look at how somebody responds and understand what the person is saying, right? Many people say, well, Jesus never said that he was God. Well, it's interesting because many times the Pharisees and the leaders and the religious leaders wanted to kill him. Why? Because he claimed to be God. 
You know, um, so you can look at the response and understand what Jesus is saying, you know, in that situation here, you can look at the response of the disciples, understanding what he's saying. And I believe this lesson is on the impossibility of salvation and the riches that come from sacrifice. There's really two lessons here. Um, you might say this is a lesson on spiritual wealth. So the impossibility of salvation, um, after the young man left his heart and Jesus turned around, looked at his disciples and made this astonishing statement. And when you carry what we just talked about into here, you have a little bit of understanding of why the disciples were astonished, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom. So in their minds, the person who was closest to entering the kingdom was a rich man, especially a religious rich man. And Jesus is saying that that person, it's difficult, difficult. Now, the word difficult is, is interesting. He uses it twice here. And the word difficult, literally in the Greek, it's only, it only shows up three times. And in each one of these passages, when Jesus is saying it's the only time it shows up in Scripture, it literally means that trying to push something that's too big through a small hole. <laughs> that's what it means in the Greek. Something that's too large to fit in a small place. In other words, it's an impossible thing to do. Um, and I think that's very interesting because Jesus gives an illustration of pushing something too big through a small hole, right? A camel through an eye of a needle kind of thing. Um, so he even uses a Greek word that emphasizes that. And that's the word that Jesus uses to describe salvation. It's, a, it's impossible. You cannot push something too large through a small hole. And, um, and the word later on, he says the second time in verse 24, how difficult. He actually uses another word, but it's related to the same word. And this is the only time it shows up in Scripture. And it means the same thing. It's related. It means something too big to fit through a small, a small opening. Um, so I've heard, uh, it, then he goes in and he explains, it's like putting a camel through the eye of a needle. Now, when I was growing up, I heard lots of reasons why this wasn't impossible. It was just difficult, right? They're trying to match up a difficult. So they started, I heard, have you ever heard of the example of the needle gate? In, in sermons and stuff, you ever heard of this phrase? Well, there was a needle gate and a camel had to kneel down. You'd take up all the baggage and you could kind of push him through this gate, but it was really difficult. Um, there is no, there is no uh, archaeological evidence for any needle gate in writing. It, we trace it back to, um, back to around the, the, 1100, the uh, 11th century. Uh, some, some monks wrote this and they're trying to explain it away. And it showed up in um, Aquinas' writings and stuff like that. But there's no evidence that it ever was a needle gate. Even if there was a needle gate, it doesn't make sense you would try to push a camel through it because 50... 50 yards on either side, there's gates that normal animals would go through just fine. Why would you do that? It doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense. So, and besides, it doesn't fit the example he's given. Plus, on top of that, there was writing by the rabbis, and they used this phrase all the time, and it was used always to describe something that's impossible to do, like a leopard changing its spots. That, that, those are the examples that they give. You can't do it. It's impossible. Um, so I really think he's talking about a literal needle and a literal camel. And um, this, this is a very Jewish, uh, we don't see the humor in there, but humor to them, you know how different cultures have different humor, you know, ways of laughing at things and thinking things are funny. This actually is sort of a, of, is a, is a joke. Um, and the Jews play on words and um, words that sounded very close together. That was sort of their offhanded, kind of sarcastic, joking kind of manner to prove a point. And I think that's what Jesus is doing. Hey, it's like putting a camel through an eye of a needle. And you told that to a little child, they laugh and go, that, that's not possible. And like, exactly, um, it's, it's impossible. And you see their conclusion um, or their, their response. First in 1024, they were amazed and astonished. Um, in 1024, that verse, verse 24, that word for astonished is thumbeo, which is described as dumbfounded to the point of being emotionally stalled. It's like... <laughs> You can just picture it, right? A cartoon, like, what? Or, uh, and when I was growing up, the cartoons, the jaw would drop to the floor and their eyes would bug out. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? Yes. And then in 26, exceedingly astonished, different word, ekplesa, which described as struck out of one's senses. And, and, or it could be to strike somebody with a panic. And think about if you thought that was the way to salvation. Now, well, who in the world can be saved? And nobody can be saved what am I going to do? <laughs> you see this, this astonishment, this, this, uh, uh, this uh, panic, and the response echoes the proper understanding, well, then who can be saved? Um, so the, the rich, according to the teaching of the day, were so close to God as evidenced by their wealth. And if wealth could increase the amount of works, 
they could do so. And if they couldn't enter the kingdom of God, then who could? If they were poor, how and what hope did they possibly have? Um, so what would you have said as a disciple? So I was thinking, what, what would I have said? Um, you know, Peter, I think, came to the right conclusion. We'll see in the second part of this. He goes, well, we have given up all. And that, that's exactly, and they, the disciples that's talking to Jesus, that Jesus is teaching, stand in direct contrast against the rich young, rich young ruler, right? Because Jesus said, follow me. And what did they do? They followed him. Could Matthew go back to collecting taxes? No. You know, um, Peter and John probably couldn't just jump right into where, to where they were. Um, they had left all. They left, you know, houses and lands and whatever it was. They, they know and Jesus knew, um, but they had given up. So I think Peter ended up with the right, um, the right answer. But the tension here is important to see because the resolution is really gloriously merciful. So we're painting a really dark picture of it's impossible, right? But we also know that people get saved. So the question is, how? How does that work? How can it be impossible? And this is where, um, there's just to borrow a little theological terminology, you might have heard this phrase of total depravity. Um, and it doesn't mean that a person is evil as they possibly can be. It means that they are perfectly helpless. There's no way. They're perfectly, it may the way say total helplessness to save myself. Just like I can't pull myself up by my bootstraps, I cannot save myself. It takes God's, uh, God's work. And this is very consistent in all of, all of Scripture. But there's some other impossible things um, that you see. And the same word Jesus uses in Luke 1.37, um, actually the angel uses when he speaks to Mary. Um, and she's like, how can this be? How can I have a child in me when I'm not known a man? Right? And the angel says, nothing will be impossible with God. Right? Um, this was in reference to Mary conceiving. Um, in John 3.3, 3, Jesus speaking to Nicodemus says, to see the kingdom of God um, or to be saved, um, you must be born from above. Now we have the phrase born from again, but in the Greek, the word literally means born from above or born from heaven, born, born not of this world. So flesh is born from flesh, spirit is born from spirit, spirit is above, flesh is here on the earth, you must be born from above. Um, is what he says. He goes on to explain that those in the kingdom of God are born of the spirit. And the wind, and he gives an example, the wind blows wherever it wants. Can you look outside and tell which way the wind is going to blow? You can see where it's, well, actually you can't see the wind blowing. I can look out there and see the flag blowing and I make the assumption that the wind is blowing that way, but I don't know which way the wind is going, right? I can just see the results of the wind going. I can't see the wind. And he uses that as an illustration of somebody becoming born from above. You can't see it, but you can see the results of it, right? Um, that, that's the illustration. Then later, Peter understood this, and in 1 Peter 1, 3, he wrote, of God the Father, he has caused us to be born from above, or born again. Um, the causing of the birth is God the Father. It's not impossible with him to cause us, as children, to be born into his family. Um, and you layer that on top of what Jesus said, it's impossible with man, but it is possible with God. And I, if you take time and meditate on this, it's a wonderful, glorious, grace-filled thing that God would cause us to be born again, not because of anything I am, but because of who he is and how much he loves me. Um, and not only did he cause me to be born again, he made me righteous like his son. So when he sees me, he doesn't see me as a disobedient, rebellious child, even though I am, he sees the righteousness of Christ and that makes me acceptable to him. Um, and that's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So the rich, while the rich young man sought eternal life by goodness, by his law keeping and by his riches, um, they could no way assist him in getting eternal life. Uh, only by setting all this aside and crying out to God who gives life can someone truly be born from above. Um, the wind blows where it will. Um, and at this moment, I do think later, but I think at this moment, it didn't blow towards the rich young man. Um, so a man cannot enter the kingdom of God. And notice that the entering the kingdom of God and being saved, the disciples connect those two things. So when you see entering the kingdom of God, the synonym to that is being saved. And the disciples understood that, and they understood that. And to, to get eternal life also was another idiom that they used for salvation. We say things like born again, saved, um, uh, accepting Christ as our Savior, things like that. To them, their idioms were getting eternal life, entering the kingdom of God, that, those kinds of things, entering the kingdom, those were synonyms for salvation. Um, so a question arises for the current sinner. If you know somebody who isn't saved, um, what are we going to say to a sinner who hasn't been born from above? 
And um, taking what I learned here, I just wrote as if I was writing, and I've, I've done this a few times that people weren't a believer, but um, I would say it this way, dear sinner, are you at the point where you are done with being a sinner and want to enter the kingdom of God? Are you willing to leave behind all that you are? I said willing, right? Are you willing to leave behind all that you are, all that you have done, and all that you possess and follow Jesus? If so, then cry out to God and ask him to be gracious to you, to save you, because it is he who does the work of saving. The great question is this, are you willing? If so, cry out to God right now with a willing heart. You know, that's, that, that's the call that you see Jesus give um, to this rich young man, and it's really what he's teaching the disciples. So wrapping up here on the last few minutes, the disciples' spiritual wealth. Um, this also is really a beautiful picture. Peter spoke up and pointed out that they had left everything and followed Jesus. Well, what about us? You know, you could, this is a very Peter, Peterish thing to say. Um, well, what about us? Look, we've, we've left everything and followed you, and, and we give Peter a hard time, but honestly, he was just saying what was in the hearts of most of the disciples. He was speaking for them. In fact, I can totally see them say, hey, ask Jesus this, and Peter was like, okay, I'll ask him. You know, and uh, so we, we always say he has a foot-shaped mouth, you know, uh, but yeah, I think he was also a spokesman for the disciples, and he said, hey, look, we've, we've left, um, well, what does he say? See, we have left everything. See, I was, I was speaking for everybody, right? We've left everything. Um, and uh, um, Jesus tells them they have great reward. A um, hundredfold is what he says. And that is, I mean, just think of the wealth that God has granted you on this earth. And in the whole world, comparatively, we are extremely wealthy from most of the world. And imagine getting a hundred times that, a hundred times that. You have a house, imagine a hundred houses. <laughs> You have a retirement, imagine 100 times what you have in your retirement. Whatever it is, 100-fold. Um, you have two parents, right? What about having 200? I mean, are you blessed by your parents and your mom? How about having 100 more like her? I mean, it's just, it's, it's just amazing to think about it. And he, Jesus gives um, three ages that they receive the blessing. And Mark, it only shows two. But in Matthew, he actually adds another one, um, which is really cool as well. But first of all, the first age in this church age, um, the disciples had left father and mother, sisters and brothers, but their family would be even greater. Um, and you say, well, how would their family get greater? Well, their earthly family, they had left, but the church family they had gained. Now, they probably didn't see it as a church family, but just imagine how fast the church grew after Jesus was gone. In their lifetimes, in the disciples' lifetimes, how many mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters would they gain? They left a couple and they gained thousands, right? There were, what, 3,000 3, people? Uh, that were saved in one of Peter's first sermons, right? There's 3,000 people he didn't have before that were fellow brothers and sisters. And I don't know if you've had a really close relationship with people at church, but they, those, those are eternal relationships. They never end. I mean, if everyone here is a believer, I'm going to know Vicki a trillion years from now. She's going to have to deal with me. <laughs> right? She, I mean, think about that. These are relationships that last forever, that will never be gone. Um, think of how much greater that is than a, than a family where your brother and sister may die and you may never see them again, right? Um, the, the greatness of that. Um, and notice that he fits in. It stood out at me. Uh, I wish he wouldn't put that in there, but it's true. In verse 30, with persecutions. Yes. So in the church age... <laughs> You're going to have a greater family, but you're also going to have persecutions. And he calls that, and he puts that under the category of blessings. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but think about that. How can persecutions be blessings? They are, um, but if you, I want you to kind of think about that, look through Scripture, or at least think about it while you read through Scripture and see if you can't test that to see if that is, is the case elsewhere. The second, the second one, I was in the millennial age, you don't see this in Mark. You'd have to turn back to Matthew. In Matthew 19, um, verse 28, he says it this way. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And I see that very clearly as the millennial age. Um, that what you're looking at here is that thousand-year reign that these 12 disciples have followed Jesus, well, I guess 11 he was speaking to and one that was added a little later. Those 12 people, so instead of Judas, it was Matthias, I think. Uh, they will sit on 12 literal thrones. Jesus will sit on a literal throne and rule the world. And these 12 disciples will sit on 12 literal thrones and they will rule Israel. 
Well, saying the 12 tribes, it doesn't mean that they each get a tribe. It could mean, but it also could mean that they just rule together over all of Israel. Um, and that is, that, that's another benefit. So not only do you get an increased family in this world, you're also going to, in the next, you're going to rule with me. And then if that wasn't great enough, in, in, back in Mark, he says, um, and in the age to come, they would inherit eternal life. This benefit would last for all eternity, and that's what the Jews were looking for, is a blessed life. They called it shalom, and shalom is more than peace. It's a complete peace. It's, there's nobody, I mean, everything is best, as good as it possibly can be. Um, and there's, there's perfect bliss, there's perfect peace, everything is going well, none of your kids are arguing with each other, you're getting along with your neighbors, you like you, the work that you do. I mean, it's sort of, imagine everything going well. This is, this is what they saw as eternal life, as shalom. And that's why they mention it to people. They want you to have shalom, like a wholeness of life, not just um, a longness. So we see in the Western world, we see eternal life as a length of life. They saw it as a quality of life. Mm -hmm. And I think combining those two, you get the real answer of what eternal life is. Uh, it's, it's a length and it's a quality that lasts forever. A good way to describe this, I think, really comes from uh, a journal entry on October 28, 1949. And actually, when I was looking, that, looking for this, from Jim Elliott, Jim Elliott we, all, we all know who he is, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, somebody had scanned his actual journal. So I, was, I looked at his actual journal, his own handwriting, and see what he wrote before and what he wrote after. But he wrote on October 28, 1949, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And I think it fits perfectly here with what the rich young ruler, what he taught the disciples, and at this, this last verse we'll look at here in the last few minutes. Um, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain which we, that which he cannot lose. And that speaks strongly against the world's view of wealth. And it speaks strongly for how Jesus views spiritual wealth. Um, it's not in the possessions that you have, really. It's the possessions that have you. No possessions should have you. Um, it's okay to have possessions. There's many rich women who follow Jesus and contributed to his ministry. And you never see him, um, you know, make them sell everything and follow him. They just follow him, I think, because those possessions didn't have them. They just happen to have possessions. You see, see the difference? There's a, I know it's a, I'm not trying to just play games with words. I really mean this, that you want to make sure in your heart that nothing that you own owns you that you don't change spiritual decisions based on an earthly possession. You know, I need to do this. I don't need to go to church because I'm going to do this. Does that possession have a higher place than a spiritual place? What about your family? Would you rather see your spiritual family or rather do something? You know, so you can ask those questions in your heart of hearts, but that's, I think, what Jesus is getting at here. Um, then the last, um, from the age to come, this last statement of Jesus in this passage, but many who are first will be last and the last first. Now, when I was a kid, a preacher's kid growing up, I had a lot of kids that would say this, you know, if I was first in line, they would say, well, you should be last, right? <laughs> and we would view a line like going this way, and somebody that's in the first would come to the back and you kind of switch all this stuff, right? Um, think of it this way. Think of the line like this and just turning it sideways so we're all first. I think that's what he's talking about. Um, that in, in salvation, this is talking about eternal life here. In eternal life, you notice he didn't talk about all the things that we know are coming in the next age. A new heaven, a new earth, uh, all the riches and the wealth and all these things that we know that we see and we read in these different passages. He doesn't talk about that. He just says eternal life. And then he says the last will be first and the first will be last, right? Um, I think what he's talking about here is very similar to the parable. Remember the, the laborers in the field? He came at the early part of the morning. He says, I'll pay you a denarius, a day's work. If you come out and work. So they came and started working, went back at noon. Hey, would you come work? I'll pay you a denarius. And they came in at like four o'clock and said, would you finish working? And, and so we came to pay. He on purpose paid the people who came last and he paid them the same amount as the people of the first. And remember the people of the first said, well, that's not fair. And he says, didn't I not tell you that I would pay you a denarius? Can I not do with my money what I want to do? And I think that's the picture of eternal life. There's, a, there's the thief on the cross who served Jesus how long? An hour, maybe, four hours. Um, he was in paradise, and then he was in heaven, right? And he'll live forever, have eternal life. What about us who were saved when they were four years old and served their entire life, 80, 90 years? They get paid the same eternal life. The first will be last, and the last will be first. So there's, no, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, man or woman, child or adult. God caused each of his children to be born from above. 
We are all born from the same spirit, the same father. We inherit the same righteousness of Jesus. We all have eternal life. So those who are last are first. Those who are first that are last. Um, I, that's what I believe he's saying here. So we only have a couple more minutes before we close. Any, any comments or anything you'd like to jump in while I take a drink here? <laughs> Our questioners aren't here, so I have to keep talking <laughs> through it. Usually I get, a, I get a break and I answer a question. So, yes. <laughs> no, you were the only one that spoke up, so you've got something else to share? Okay. What about you, Dennis? That's fine. You're copacetic? Yeah, he's already mowed the lawn this morning and went to Home Depot. Oh, man. I know. You've done way more than I have this morning. I started mowing the lawn at 6 o'clock. I was mad. That was too early. Then she, I got done, she goes, the cop called, they're going to arrest you. (laughs) (laughs) Too much noise early in the morning, woke up all the neighbors. We only have one neighbor on one side that's gone right now because they moved out. So I'm like, it's still pretty bad. Yeah. Well, before you before you leave, Dennis, I got a funny story to tell you about that, but I don't want to show up on the on YouTube. So let me let me pray, Heavenly Father. We thank you for these truths. We we pray that in some small way you would use these truths to impact our our thinking, our way of seeing salvation. That you would make us more um, more accurate, more uh, working in concert with how the Holy Spirit is is convicting how you work in people's hearts. We pray that you would just give us eyes to see people the way you see them. Um, I'll cause us to align uh, that this plan of salvation is called the salvation with you. We pray that we would this week uh, just uh, present this gospel to the to those, to at least one person and let them know, are you, are you ready? Are you ready to give up? Are you willing to give up all you have and cry out to God? And he, he is the one who is mighty to save. I pray that this would all work for the glory of your great son. We pray this in your son's name, amen.